Muy buenas tardes en nombre del Foro Económico Mundial. Quiero darles la bienvenida a esta sesión de la tarde sobre resiliencia y preparación ante los desastres naturales. Esta sesión les va a dar nuevas perspectivas. I want to thank you for being here uh, in this very important topic because of its uh, human and environmental cost. We have seen how serious uh, natural disasters are. Felipe, who is with us here, has had that ex has had that experience, and we are going to work uh, today. We are going to talk about how to mitigate these uh, risks. Uh, these disasters. I want to introduce our panelists, and he speaks from experience. Felipe has been in front of the response to natural disaster in Chile. He was the deputy for disaster relief uh, after the earthquake in his country, Chile. Felipe, you experienced one of the strongest earthquakes in the history in recorded history, and you had a lot to do with the efforts, reconstruction efforts. What what can we learn from that experience? Well, there, first of all, I want to thank you for your invitation. I think that in Chile, we had one of the disasters that most uh, marked Sebastián Piñera's administration because it happened three weeks before Sebastián Piñera took office. And we had something where some Things where, yes, uh, we had uh, positive results and others where we made a mistake and we made a mistake in the expectations. We generated too many expectations of uh, rebuilding very fast. And that generated a very complex political dynamic. So it's a saying that says under promise and over deliver. I think that in an emergency, it's much better, at least uh, at times of difficulties, it's good to lower expectations and don't wear your Superman uh, costume because it's very difficult to deal with a disaster like the one that we had in February 27 of 2010. We were simply not prepared. What do I feel we, we did right? First, it was very important uh, that the part that the person in charge of reconstruction or the emergency had a lot of power and formal power, not only a commission, not only just somebody drawn on the wall, uh, but there was, uh, I was Minister of Social Development and we had the Minister of the Interior. We set up a committee made up of two uh, ministers, uh, that Minister of the Interior is the one who deals with the armed forces, but they have a buffer. They have a buffer even for wars, and they work very well as a, as a buffer, as a insurance, even for emergencies. So you must have the military forces and the police on your side. Fortunately, we had them on our side. If you don't, you're lost. The second lesson is that there is a very big temptation to confuse quick with good, and uh, speed at a given point can be the enemy of a good reconstruction. You have two alternatives. Either you build at the Soviet style, with the Soviet style, a new city in a different uh, uh, place. Uh, you, uh, you hire a wonderful construction system to build houses in six months, and you build well and not fast, and you build in the same site where the families lived, respecting their culture, their history, and their networks. This choice is very difficult. Uh, President Pinero's only had four years to do this. And I think that we made the decision to reconstruct in the same place. And But we had to, we, it, it was very difficult. Everyone wanted a little house here, a little house there. And we set up packages by neighborhoods so that building companies could bid these words. So fast is not the same as good.
And in the third place, reconstruction and emergency processes are not only physical infrastructure systems. It's not a question of building houses. These are psychological processes and political, too. And so if you want to be successful as a state, as the government, it's very important for psychological reconstruction to be very close. They have to be very close. Uh, to their families because otherwise it can blow up in your in your in your face. We wanted to do a lot of reengineering. After two years, we had to learn that we had to be closer to the communities that had been affected. Another lesson that we learned, then uh, perhaps those of you who are here who have had to cope with an emergency. I just came from Ecuador. I was invited by the planning minister uh, to tell the Chilean experience. We met with the uh, VP of Ecuador, with a whole lot of ministers. When you're in the middle of an emergency, there's this temptation uh, because you don't know what kind of an emergency home you are going to deliver. There's one that is quick, but it's not so bad uh, so as to make it difficult for them to spend a winter. On the other hand, it can't be that good because otherwise they're going to stay there forever. In Chile, we rebuilt 200,000 homes with the contribution of the central government. That's a decision that not all countries want to make but the homes were the big problem we had. So we didn't name very well at the beginning, but after that, we made a very, we made a very wise decision. Of course, we built uh, these very precarious uh, homes, uh, three by six meters. And then we thought that the correct answer, and I think that's what Ecuador is going to do because I recommended it very forcefully, is that they set up a lease, a home lease system. You can only do this in uh, large cities, but the lease has the virtue that you don't have to create uh, slumps or very complex uh, villas for security for girls, for families, which are very difficult to handle, and they require lots of effort and lots of money. At least when you absorb a family to reabsorb in another one with a lease, it's very feasible. They can pay a lease. They, they can pay a lease, a rental. So it's better to provide uh, a rental fee than to build a new home. And I have two more points, no, three more points. To occupy the market, to occupy the market smartly. And I'm going to tell you what that means. When we had the earthquake, we had many emergency homes built. But the emergency homes would not get there. We would do the purchase order and everything, and we would not get the homes. But we were confused. We thought, why weren't, why aren't we getting these uh, houses? We had people living in tents. So I took my car, and I went to talk to the people who build the emergency homes. And I get there, and all the emergency homes were piled one on top of the other. So I am a joker, so I said, so I thought, I thought, well, this is very simple. Now I know what happens. The slope of the price was going up. Of course, the winter would come in three more months. So any economic agent would do exactly the same, waiting for the winter so that they could deliver these houses. And so what we did was change the slope. And we said, what is going on here is a very simple economic issue. And we said, let's change the slope. The houses that we get next week are not going to cost $1,000, but $1,300. One week later, 1,200. One week later, 1,100. 
and after that 900, and after that, etc. And we switched the direction of the slope. The mass media, they, of course, they, they, they said, well, how can you do this? How can you fall uh, prey of these practices? But I said, do you want these families to have a house, or do you want me to just cross my hands and not do anything until the winter comes? Obviously, the following week, we got all the houses, all those uh, constructors, they, they realized that the price was going down, so they decided to deliver their houses. Now, emergencies are so traumatic, and they produce so much anguish and despair that the state cannot add any anguish to the pain of the reconstruction. So delivering information is key. Terms and terms and deadlines, and here I again refer to the expectations. You always have to give yourself some, some time. Give yourself some breathing space. Uh, I always said, well, tell that well, we always have to count on the fact that builders are going to take longer than they say. Because if you say it's in August, that family is going to feel betrayed between August and November when they finally get the, the unit. So it's very important to give orderly information because people are hurting. People are sad, people are worried, they're desperate, and and if you don't meet a deadline, it's horrible. But And the other extreme is just hiding yourself in an office among four, among four walls and not give any information because you feel it's a waste of time to report to the families, but that adds the anguish of not knowing anything. You cannot confuse the people any further. So information mitigates anguish and confusion. And the last thing that is very important is to decentralize. Why decentralizing? And I will conclude with an anecdote. I was the Minister of Social Development. The first thing that uh, President Pineda asked me was, how many are they? What do they need? Where are they? Give me cadastro information. So I called David Bravo, who is an expert in surveys, and I come from the academia. And David is a very serious guy, and he's very good for surveys. He works uh, in Chile. He does the Casen survey, which is one of the best in the country. And I said, what possibilities are there for you to survey these people to know exactly what family needs, where they are, uh, Joe referenced, if possible, so that we can give him the aid. And now he looks at me. And he said, no problem, no problem, this is March. In September, I'll have the cadastro information. And I said, you may understand that I said, David, nice to meet you. And we had this idea, it was great because, uh, in fact, it had an additional benefit. We said, who are the people who have the information? Quickly, by tomorrow, the mayor. The mayor, the local authorities, uh, with more or less uh, errors because there's better or worse uh, mayors, and we thought, Let, we got to trust them, let's use them. And it worked very well, and we put the army with the mayors. Uh, we got there very quickly, and later on, I had an additional benefit. When I decentralized, I was able to also obtain some kind of a political protection, some kind of a political shield, because two years later, I was summoned to appear before Congress because there was a scandal that came up that they had found 50 emergency units, 50 out of 70,000, I must clarify, but 50 that had been given to families who didn't need them. So I went to Congress, and they were very harsh on me. They said, whoa, how could you give these uh, houses to people who didn't need them? And there was a congressman, and I asked, what area are you from? And he said, because he was saying that they belong to his area. And I said, do you know the mayor of your, your area where you live? He belongs to your party. Well, of course I know him. Of course I know him. 
And so I gave him the procedure that uh, we had, and I said, go ask your mayor why these 50 families received uh, the, the houses, why these were the wrong families to get the houses. So that procedure, that serious procedure, of course, it generates a bit of, a, of an error margin because you think that centrally you're going to be more rigorous. But uh, basically, decentralization, there's really no doubt. There's really no doubt. It's better to make 10% mistakes and to paralyze the project and trusting the state bureaucracy, thinking that you're going to have the solution sitting in the government palace. That's impossible. And you, But you can clarify to the mayors that the general controller of the republic is going to audit them and that we are going to make sure that that happens. Felipe, you have talked a lot about reconstruction. I think the lessons you have shared with us are practical and realistic and very valuable. Talk to us about the investments that our country can do to mitigate the risk so that construction and investment are less. Well, something that worked very well and which is very difficult to do is that in Chile we have, and that is why so such few people died because of the earthquake. Most of them died. Most of the deaths were caused by the tsunami. Uh, it was the tsunami which caused more lives. What I think we have to do is that the ministries of housing, all the regulation must contemplate uh, normal construction of uh, schools, of everything. They must contemplate this reality. Peru and Ecuador are doing this already. And the other thing we have to do is that, well, you have to have the army prepared and not set up something in parallel so that that army or that institutional infrastructure that you already have, it can be adapted in an emer in, the, in case of emergency. Something new is no good. You cannot set up a new institution. There's no way, there's no time. Of course, we have an emergency office, but it's relatively little as compared to the big emergencies. So, so the schools, the existing institutions have to adapt themselves and have to transform into emergency institutions. Now, in Chile, we haven't done it. If there's another earthquake, another tsunami like the one we had, and of course, we can. I, I can explain to you what we learned, but our mistake was not to build a protocol to make it automatic. That's wonderful. We have 10 minutes, and we want to give the audience the possibility of addressing questions directly for Felipe. I got here a bit late, so I apologize if I ask something that you already said. I belong to an emergency brigade for 10 years, and I got to see all my my entire country in that capacity. But I'm a, psycholo a psychologist, and I'm from Costa Rica. And I don't know what value you see in the other part, the psychological part. It's uh, key. We made a mistake at the beginning, and there were big protests because we did not get there on time uh, with the psychological and social aid. We did it, but we did it wrong because we outsourced it. And there's a way to leverage uh, with the uh, social society, but instead of making it an integral part of the process, it was like the poor brother to us. We didn't handle it right, but then then we tried to fix it, and uh, there was there were some leaders that were there, and they used to say, Felipe, we're very glad that you're building rebuilding our homes, but I want you to take the 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 lion out of the house. And who's the lion? Well, it's my husband who's been there 15 months without working, and I don't know what to do with him. I want to kill him. So that's where we got this wonderful idea, which was to, to do a Vina festival in uh, the zero area, because that was a coast area that lived out of tourism, and nobody went anymore. So we held the festival, the Vina and Mar festival there, but for several weekends, so that every weekend there was a flow of tourists, and that reactivated the economy. That's very important. I was forgetting to tell you this. I come from Ecuador. 
water and they had these emergency tents and they were feeding them. And uh, my recommendation was take this out of here because otherwise uh, trade is not going to work. Uh, the, the guy who sells food in the corner in the mom and pop store is never going to be able to stand up again. So why don't you spend the money subsidizing the entrepreneur so that the entrepreneurs can build their kiosks and their stores. But you cannot give so much assistance to people because you do away with entrepreneurship. Okay, well, there are no more questions. I take uh, three uh, lessons uh, from this session. Uh, there are three takeaways that I want to summarize. One, that repair and mitigation are very important. The protocol, the rules, generally in our country, that issue is very weak because our institutions are weak, but it would save a lot of resources in handling disaster and for in disaster relief activities. And I liked what you said about the fact that this is not just engineering because in the government you want to execute the budget. You want to build. Uh, we're normally measured in terms of the civil works, which are visible, but we cannot forget the psychological part and the reinsertion of people into the productive apparatus. And we cannot forget about uh, children either. And the third thing that I thought was very different and innovating was using the market forces because you not only used it in your analogy about public uh, contracts, but about how to reactivate the community and how to help them to be more resilient. Let's use market forces not only to be more efficient from the state, but to have the community more and be more resilient. And I don't know if before closing you want to share with us your experience with Ecuador, which would be very relevant. Well, I was pleasantly surprised in Ecuador. They're very receptive, and they were highly prepared for their orderly reconstruction. But they had the same problem as uh, we did in Chile, in the sense that private aid, public, uh, uh, private cooperation is very complicated. It was total chaos. Many of the international agencies that want to help you end up helping very little. They're highly bureaucratic. They come with a mentality of what they want to know. So I think that what in Chile we should do and we shouldn't and we haven't done is to have a platform, a, a, a platform to, for, to handle the public-private cooperation so that we don't get all diapers in just one same town and then all the bottles of water in another town so that we can coordinate the aid we get. So there's an issue there that we have not solved. And I think that uh, governments, I was talking to the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador, and he was saying it was very difficult. I used to get at the embassy things that was that everybody was sending from everywhere in the world, and it was very difficult to get to bring things from China, for example. It was difficult to do it in a smart way. So I said, what you have to do is very simple carry out a launch a donations campaign or let the social the let the civil society organize it things that are easy to transport money uh, all kinds of resources because you can't say no I don't want the help from the Chinese embassy because I mean they'll hang you out to dry so basically we in Chile we had a lot of help and I was very grateful but we did not have a platform to help us ensure that the public-private cooperation worked. So I think that now that we talk about cooperation between sectors, I think uh, that we can reflect that there are things that we can do from now to mitigate and not wait until the disasters uh, come up. So Felipe, congratulations for your great job, and thank you for sharing your experience.